second. Welcome to another episode of The Roundtable. Today, we're going to be talking about meet day coaching. So we'll cover a bit about on the coaching side of things, the things that we're looking out for to ensure our athletes have a good day on the platform. And then we could also cover some stories where there's been an aspect where you've learned on the platform, like I'm going to keep trying to do this moving forward or where there's been a mistake or where you've struggled and how you've learned from that. Um, so to kick things off, Sam, do you want to cover what are some things that you start looking out for to ensure a successful meet day? Um, yeah, so main thing, I guess, probably majority of my client base in terms of looking after them for competitions throughout the year is purely online. So it comes from, you know, having a handler um, to run them through the day. So on from an external sense, in terms of comp day with clients online, um, just making sure that the athlete knows their plan well in advance. Um, so putting it together, the competition plan, I normally like screen record and talk through in terms of like, you know, A, B and C options for attempts, warm up timings, um, all that kind of stuff. And then just relaying that to the handler as well. Um, and then just being on board throughout the competition to help out when needed. Um, from a face-to-face -face, in-person sense, in terms of competition handling, it's essentially the same thing. So just putting the time in normally in that comp week uh, to make sure that, you know, you're fully prepared with the competition plan. The athlete knows kind of what to expect for the day two in terms of their own performance. Um, and then, yeah, the logistics of the day. So then when you get to the platform or you get to the competition, you're not getting all those kind of small little questions that are just a distraction basically. Um, so yeah, just making sure that, you know, the athlete kind of during the week of competition, they have an opportunity to kind of ask any questions that they have on what to kind of expect or, you know, if they have any kind of issues and clear all that before the day. Yeah. I think it's really important to have everything kind of set up before the day. Cause then once, if you're still trying to figure things out as the day's happening, it gets really hectic, right? Mm. Cause as, as coaches, you've kind of got this idea of like logis like, I feel like as coaches, right? Like we're trying to just sort out the logistics on the day. Like you need to be here at this time. Um, you need to be warming up at this time. But if people start like second guessing or they're not sure where, where they need to be at the right time, um, that's where things can get a little bit um, up in the air. Do you yeah. guys have anything to, to add to that as well? Any other aspects that you feel like would create a successful meet day for someone? I think it just depends on the client you have, right? Like if you're working with experienced lifters who have done many competitions, they're going to be aware of, um like equipment things that they need to have whereas I guess like for like Leanne Dave myself like where we probably had more novice lifters transitioning into like sanctioned competitions it's like them just being aware of like the little things like the underwear rule like what you can and can't wear um deadlift socks like you have to have them like other little variables like that um and I think it just depends on like I find as well because I'm big on like the nutrition side of things a lot of people will just randomly ask me questions throughout the day they're like oh do you think I should have this caffeine here or should I eat now or like I kind of get questions like that on the fly sometimes on comp day um but like that's something now that I sort of just like provide and give to any nutrition client that I have like I'll give them sort of like a comp day plan of like when to eat what, um, especially if they're not like specifically weight cutting, if they're weight cutting, that's a whole other story. But if it's just like nutrition in general, I'll just give them like, okay, like these are the foods you can have, like don't change any variables, you know, eat the same thing, um, like practice and trial, how you want to have caffeine and food in training prior to a competition day. So you can kind of just replicate it and know how your body responds. But I think other than like what Sam said, they're all pretty much like the main variables that we sort of control um and it, a lot I think a lot of clients they just lean on you so really like they'll just listen to what you have to say so it's like because I guess like as a team and as Perth we usually have all of the timing sort of laid out it's like us just being like okay come back at this time after you know squats and we're gonna start getting ready for bench and the athlete will just listen yeah I think we've got it down pretty pat in terms of having a system where we can tell people where to go things like that um, I think what where it could be a bit of a struggle is like say you're handling like 10 people 
right yeah. versus one person and yeah. that's kind of what what I wanted to discuss about like you brought up the point of people leaning on you and doing whatever they need to do um and that raises the question of like autonomy on meet day right so the more you start competing the more you realize okay like all I need to do is follow follow this warm up plan and that's going to get me on the platform at the right time but if you're not as autonomous you kind of like jump the gun a little you're too early you're a bit too late um, and that's where it's a bit of a struggle. Um, yeah. There, yeah, I'll just jump in quickly. There definitely has to be some like autonomy on the athlete side of things. If you're handling, you know, multiple lifters in a competition, I think we like a good example for this. I always remember back to like junior nationals down in Melbourne um, for like the 74, 83 session. Um, you know, Steve, Kelly, I think you, amongst all you coaches, there was like, at least 10 lifters, right? All in the same session uh, across two platforms. The location and the like setting of the comp wasn't ideal, like with the, where the warm-up room was and the platforms were. So really like it was a logistical nightmare. But I think what made it so successful was like those boys in that 7483 session all knew their job. Like, you know, we were warming up on one rack. They were all like kind of taking a seat near the rack. They all knew roughly what loads they had for the next warm up and when they had to hit them. And we were there just to kind of be like, all right, yep, yeah, you go, you go, yep, yeah, you're on next, you go after this guy. Um, and then it just made the day so seamless because they understood themselves, like what they had to do to a degree. And we were there just to kind of guide along the way. So I think in situations where like it is, you know, you've got one coach for four or five people spending the extra time to make sure the athlete really knows how to warm up and when to warm up and they have a bit of control over it too can help. Yeah, I agree with that. I think like aside from attempt selections and things like that, right? Like we're looking solely at just like the logistical issue of when you have too many people. Um, I think there's, you got to build people up to that point, right? Like if it's your first competition and like as a coach you're there just solely for that person it's a very good space for you to kind of like help a bit more than usual and by usual is like you're loading the plates you're explaining like the warm-up times and everything like that but yeah. as you start scaling and naturally that's going to happen with people in, within your local area right like if you're at a local meet and you coach multiple lifters it's going to be inevitable that you're coaching more than one person right yeah. and so I feel like my role as a as a coach on that day, um, I kind of deviate away from being that person who like loads plates and things like that. And I kind of delegate that to the lifters and they understand the times that they need to warm up. And I become solely someone who can just pick attempts for them and be that second set of eyes um, on the platform. I feel like that's probably the best way to kind of get over the hurdle of like, what's the most effective thing a like game day coach can do on the day once there's too many people. Yeah. Do you guys I think, have any? Uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say like, that'll go back to like us, like, you know, yourself, Danny, me and Dave at first nation, first nations just recently where it's like Dave and I were pretty much like running the platform with pretty much all of the athletes with how busy it was. And then it was like, you were sort of running the numbers, making sure timing was right. Checking like, you know, flights, numbers, having everything updated. Like it's kind of just like becomes this like, teamwork approach where like two people are probably potentially running the platform like loading plates alongside the athletes and warming them up getting them ready and then like you're sort of running back and forth making sure that like timing's right adjusting it if needed you know making all like the like logistical and like number changes where's needed and then it's like you jumping in like if it's you know like a three flight sort of scenario like you'll jump in when another coach needs to then go and be with the athlete at the platform like running their athletes through you know their attempts um like on the platform and we sort of all just like switch and alternate from there so it's pretty much just like bouncing off one another as a team I think is what like we're like lucky to have here at Perth Emotion where we can just like use everyone and like where everyone's comfortable being is a big thing because I know like one of my biggest learnings as a coach is like like learning all like the mass and like logistics behind running competition. Like I've learned that from like you and Steve and Dave, like learning that is like really cool to see, but then being able to have everyone sort of just like taking charge of what it is that they're in charge of and letting it just like flow. It just makes it seamless. Yeah. I think us as a team is a very big benefit. Like 
when all of us are together, we can kind of easily delegate roles just because we know like we're looking after this X amount of lifters, right? So therefore all, all three of us can kind of delegate each other into certain positions to get that done. But I think expanding upon that, like if you don't have a team, right? I think still having a network on the day or even just being able to collaborate with other coaches to be able to get the job done is is huge, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be, for example, like a team of Perth, right? Like it doesn't matter what kind of coaching team you're at, but if you're working in on a rack, it's very helpful to be able to communicate with the other, other lifters like, hey, we're about to go in three minutes. Is it cool if we go then? That way you're not like squeezing all this time in, right? And then you end up having like two lifters that want to go right at the exact same time, both the last warm ups, and it becomes a headache there. Well, yeah, it's almost like, and that's what you said, it like comes back to that autonomy level of like every athlete knowing what they need to do because, you know, if if you are on like a certain platform, you know what I mean? And that's what it ends up being. Like Comte ends up being like, I guess certain coaches or like, you know, whoever's out there handling like takes a platform and then athletes order also like they basically just like jump on a platform wherever works you know based on strength or who they know where they want to work in with and it's like you know you almost end up looking after potentially like two or three other athletes that aren't necessarily yours but it makes it so much easier because it's just like you know you ask the question of like what do you need next what are you warming up to you know what's your last warm-up what's the flow and then they just it, the process of them joining in alongside what the structure that you already have is just easy yeah I agree with that. And it all comes back to autonomy, right? Like if an athlete doesn't know too much of the back end of things, then you're you're in for a very um you're in for a long day. Yeah. I think um so, especially if they're like a beginner, making sure that they know what they're doing before they get to the day. So like actually explaining kind of what happens step by step because they've never done it before. And then having like their spreadsheet with their warm ups, they know they can tell you what they need on the bar rather than kind of starting to get all frantic and then it, it makes things less smooth. So, yeah, especially with those beginners, it's really important because they don't know what they're doing essentially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll transition over to more like attempt selection wise now, though, right? So, like, once we get over that, then we could cover both like what happens at a large scale versus something where it's more close competition. Um, when there is a lot of people, I feel like one of the struggles that we might go through is because we're kind of leaving warming up to the athletes, we might sometimes skip being able to see warm ups and how things are moving. So we don't really get a good gauge until they're on the platform. Um, that's a big problem. I kind of see when we are handling like a lot of lifters at once so um for for me personally i feel like i kind of have to gauge things once i see the opener like we could have a plan and the plan can run perfectly but sometimes when it isn't moving as well we might end up having to just kind of sack the plan and go off script right and that could be both in a positive sense where we might take a bigger jump than usual or we might have to scale back um for example like i had four lifters over the weekend and I didn't really get to see the second flight of lifters because I was already putting attempts for the first flight. Right. So by the time they're coming in, it's like, Oh, I, I didn't get to see their last warm up. Um, but with that in mind, I was like, okay, I personally kind of have to be a little bit more conservative rather than just going with the plan and kind of taking things on autopilot. So as a coach, that attempt selection strategy has to be on point in, to ensure like lifters don't miss on the day because um, pretty much everything up to the warm up is you have no idea how that's going to affect um, what happens on the platform. Yeah. And like they're always going to say they're feeling good, right? So, like in the warm ups, even if you don't see them and you ask them how they're feeling, what you're going to get back is they're going to say they're feeling good. Cause they're not going to want to think about, you know, any negative thoughts for the most part. Anyway, like we, we all have clients that are a bit more straight up and we'll tell you, oh yeah, it's all right. But I think for the most part, yeah, you kind of have to just go straight off that opener when um, calling the rest of the day. Yeah. And I think I add a local meet state meet, especially if people aren't like looking for a podium finish, right? The, the main goal is going to be pretty similar for everyone, which is like, have a good day, go nine for nine and build the total so you don't really need to overextend yourself to hit a certain number that 
you're expecting to hit, right? Like if you end up just going nine for nine, you're probably going to re- look back and go, you know, I had a pretty good day. And that's the end goal that you're trying to get for everyone, right? Um, I think the thing that gets more difficult is then what happens when you have a lot of lifters and they're also competitive. Have you guys kind of like been in a situation similar to that, both the logistical challenge and competition placing? Not not personally. I don't think I've been in a situation where I've had like, I don't know, uh, two flights or multiple sessions of back-to-back like nail-biting competition. But um, we've definitely been in spots where we've had uh, multiple across the day. So maybe like one in the a.m., one in the p.m. or two in the a.m., two in the p.m., something like that. But um, never been in a situation where it's just been me solely with that. It's always been uh, someone else from the team as well. And that's been the biggest thing is like there might be two of you double checking numbers and then one of you might be running backwards and forwards to, you know, the person who's warming up for the next flight or something like that. So um, not not in the one be like the one on one kind of situation, but um, I think having the, the second person that makes it really, really nice when you have those nail biters because you can double check numbers like, hey, if I put this in, this is definitely going to be two and a half above. Right. Like. In those stressful situations, it's really easy to mess up simple math and feel like you've done the calculations wrong. So having someone else there to double check it and confirm what you've done is right is always like a really nice peace of mind kind of thing. Yeah, I agree with that. Like I had, um, if we go back to um, Newcastle Barbell when I was handling you, Shania, like for me, that was super stressful because like I was I was on my own and, and we were discussing like prior, like we we want to win. Like, it's all right if we kind of sacrifice nine for nine potentially, but you do need nine for nine to win. And it was kind of like, all right, I'm like looking at numbers. I've got, okay, if this person hits this, then they hit this. Oh, but what if they miss? Then Shania doesn't have to actually hit this. She can hit this. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. But what if they want to, the other opposition want to change their number? Oh shit, then I have to, then I have to write this. And it, it just, there was like so many cases that i had in my hand like literally just holding all the attempts going like okay whatever happens i need to end up putting in the right attempt i remember and- because i was like you were over in the corner writing like numbers down. i walked over to you and you were like go away go away and you had, like <laughs> five or like four different scenarios like going through your head of like what was going to happen i was like all right i'm gonna just leave like that's fine i'm not i'm not coach right now yeah i think the the most helpful thing in that situation is preparing the athlete to hit the biggest number possible because then yeah. once you work backwards it's like oh i've already mentally prepared to hit something bigger than this i'm good for it um i think that's something very important that i learned is like you don't want to let the athlete think like okay i'm going to put in whatever you need to win but kind of leave it ambiguous you kind of need to give a num- like a definite number go and prepare for that and leave me to do this job um, yeah I um I was the exact same that was me with Lucy at Perth Cup like that's the first comp like 1v1 where like I was just running Lucy and it was like her against Ippy and I was like running all the numbers myself basically it's the first time I've ever had to like be in that situation one handling someone but then like yeah running numbers where like you can't really run it by anybody else um and it was like it basically came down to the last pool which like we knew it was going to come down to that but I had did a similar thing where I turned to Lucy and I was like you're going to have to pull more than what you pulled in training, like get in the zone right now. And I just like told her to go away and do that. And then I was just like running numbers constantly to make sure one that like I'd done the right calculations. And I remember um, like, I think it might've been like if he's second deadlift, I like, I'd already given Lucy's third. I changed it to make it heavier, which is what I had to do. And I like ran over to Steve and like, just like word vomited what I'd had in my head to be like, did I do this right? And he basically just gave a very quick, like, yes. And I was like, sweet. And then I just like turned to Lucy and it was like, just getting her in the right zone. But it's just like, your brain is just going like a million miles an hour when you're like trying to figure out, recalculate and make sure you've got the right thing just like constantly. Yeah. Like I've, I've thought about it and I was like, okay, how, how could we make attempt selection better? Right. Like, um, for, for competitions, how do you prepare for that? Um, and I think just sitting down and like thinking out the numbers is not the same as being put in that position. Like, cause your, your heart is literally beating and you're like, okay, what's, what's five more kilos than this. 
and then you got to look at body weight advantage and like in in such a stressful situation like simple math like dave said can just be quite difficult because you like if you mess it up like you've messed it up and that could like seriously derail things like if we look at um worlds for example the example that comes to mind is like the 57s uh the french team put in the wrong attempt so whatever she had hit would have not won at all right so like i feel like that's that's the job of the coach right if if i can't do that then there's not really much point of having a game day coach right to be plain and simple um have there been stories where you guys kind of like tried to apply all these things and it just didn't work out or like you made a very crucial mistake and how have you guys learned from it sam i see you nodding your head there yeah i'll go it was i felt so bad it was probably like my oh it wasn't my first experience comp day handling but we had our novice comp here and i was looking after hugh um who was like pretty much in contention to win he had a bit of a battle and Honestly, like I still to this day, I don't know how it happened, but Dave's laughing. I was, I was, I was talking. I was at that time we didn't have all these like spreadsheets and systems in place, right? And I don't know if after this event was the catalyst to put together these spreadsheets, but essentially, it came down to the third deadlift, and I was on the, I was next to the screen. I was on the good lift, I uh, point calculator. And I rechecked this final pull like three, four, five times. I was like, all right, sweet. He only needs this. Um, anyway, turns out it was completely wrong. So the points I calculated with his competitor, I entered in hidden, entered in the wrong body weight. So I was like five kilos short. Um, oh, no. And like basically cost the big fella a little bit of cash money, <laughs> prize money. Uh, good thing it was, you know, a novice comp and he was just there to get back on the platform and have a good time. But I felt so bad. Like, and honestly, to this day, I just don't know how it happened because I looked at the body weight, I entered it in, but obviously in that scenario, like we're talking about when your heart's racing and it's the pressure's on, like I made a mistake and I made it three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, oh, since then... Man. Since then, it, it's been like making sure I'm on to numbers and I've had a lot more practice and experience practicing the numbers side of things. Like, again, it was like Perf Cup soon after that. And then um, even at Worlds, like sitting at Worlds in the stand and having the big scoreboard up on the screen, because every like kind of prime time session was a bit of a battle. Like you were talking about before, it was a good chance to just practice like basic maths and look at body weight and look at lot numbers and look at like ordering of lifts. So I think like... That was actually a cool experience to sit in a stand and like do all this number crunching in my head whilst I'm watching the lifting for the week as a little side note. Um, but yeah, takeaway, know the body weights, know the numbers, triple check with a third, fourth, fifth person if you have to, because I got it wrong. Yeah, damn. <laughs> That's painful, especially losing yeah. prize money. That's oh, that's I felt I felt terrible. I like didn't sleep that night. I don't think I felt so bad. I I feel you. I had um, so I had a similar situation. It was at Commonwealths. So um, I I was blessed to be able to handle some of the some of the boys from Sydney because like I went over to look after one of my boys, and then some of the other coaches asked if it's cool if I could handle them as well. So I handled uh Raz in the 83s. So that whole day was I had Lennox in the 74s in the morning. Then in the afternoon, I had three guys. I had uh 93, 105, and 83. So three boys. And by this time, I'm pretty tired. I think I was just running straight off caffeine, right? So we get to Raz's third squat or second squat, and it moves quite hard. I think it was like, honestly, I don't remember the number, but all I remember is the jumps. So we jump like 10 kilos, moves okay. And then that second attempt just doesn't move that well. And I'm like, okay, he's only got um, two and a half left. So in my head, I'm thinking like, I think he hit like two. I might, I might actually pull it up just so I don't get the numbers wrong. But to kind of summarize everything in my head, 
I thought I was only putting in a two and a half kilo jump. I gave him a 12 and a half kilo jump. And then this I found on, out this on squat, right? This, this is on squat. squat. Yeah. This is on yeah, squat. I remember watching that and being like, that's a bit odd. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just and he well, <laughs> like it was it was just so painful to watch because I put the number in. I think I recognized it literally like three or four seconds later. And then um thanks, Dave. Dave said 230. So I think I put 242 and a half instead of 232 and a half. Right. So like I think um yeah, like three seconds in, I was like, what did I just do? So now it's like watching out, watching this guy about to go fail because like, obviously we all kind of knew he only had two and a half, right? And putting 12 and a half, it's pretty much automatic. It's, there's no amount of hope that's going to fix it. So I'm like, fuck. And I just watch it happen. He comes out and he goes, it's all it's all good. Um, I'm speaking to Beth and shout out to Beth. She's like, you know, it's all, it's all right. And like, we recapped it after and it was like in that situation, like placing wise, it it could have gone whatever, right? Maybe it could have affected, maybe it didn't. But I remember in that moment, I was just like, what did I do? I went outside and I like punched the wall and I was just so frustrated because like, bro, how, how could you fuck that up so bad, right? Um, so from now on, it's like me realizing that you could make a silly mistake like that and that could cost a meet. Right. And it's like, it's not even got to do with another competitive. It's it's just about like double checking every single attempt to make sure that the numbers are correct. Um, so I Anna, think, int- <laughs> yeah, you guys should know. No, I was just going to say, like, I feel like that leads into like, I guess a question for everyone from my, like where my brain's kind of going is like, obviously when we do competition plans, like we usually, like we have in our spreadsheet, like a safe option, like a, like an on option so like a reach option and then just like as planned right so we have like three different options like i would be really curious to hear everyone's thoughts around what they do for like their online clients in a sense of like do you actually give the client or like the athlete and then like whoever's handling them the option to choose i guess like a safe planned and like on option for all three attempts or do you only give it for like the third attempt of each lift because Obviously, like when you're handling clients and you're handling your own clients, like you have seen their trains at the whole prep, you sort of know whether they have a little bit more gas or they don't have a little more gas or if they die off really fast Um, in terms of like first, second, third attempts on the platform. Whereas like when you're handling, you know, another person's coach's client, you kind of don't really have all that information, right? So you are really just like looking at it on the fly. You're observing how their lifts are going on the platform. So it's like, I know what I've started doing with like my online clients when I have um, them compete and get handled by somebody else is I don't actually give a safe or an on attempt. I just say as planned. Like I don't even really give them an option at all because I find that like in from like experience of like giving that option, it usually leads to mislives because, you know, either the client just really wants it, but they're not really in the position to be sort of critical and just like make the decision to like not take that reach attempt. And then the handler can kind of get pulled in when the athlete walks off and they're like, no, 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 I'm good for it. Like load it, load it. And then it just like kind of just like goes to shit. So I'm kind of just curious to hear everyone's thoughts around how they sort of plan that with like their online clients and what they think, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I think with, with that on attempt, I'm very careful with where to put it. Um, I got to, when I put that number in, I make sure that it's still a realistic number that they want to hit. And then I kind of talk them down from it, right? So it's yeah. it's usually not in a place where it's um, unrealistic. So, and if it is, um, prior to putting that number in, I'll discuss like, hey, considering your training and everything, I think this number that you want to put as a third potential reach option is still a bit too unrealistic, right? But if if it is something that I'm okay with and it checks out in training, then it's like, okay, we could put that there and then I'll also have contingency plans for if not all the stars align. Right. I, um, yeah, I agree. Um, I think that with the, that on attempt as well, it's like, it's either like something that they've already hit before, or it's also knowing like the athlete themselves, if they're good at picking loads in training, if they're good at picking loads and you know, you can give them that, that on attempt. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you, yeah, usually having the on attempt can help them, um, you know, 
feel confident in if they've hit it before, feel confident that they can hit it again on the platform. Yeah. But. One thing, one thing I like to say, especially like going into that third attempt is like, okay, you want to hit, you want to hit this number. You got to show me how you're going to move these first two attempts. And that can kind of be almost like a driving point um, for hitting something that's pretty big. And they might not end up hitting what they want to hit on their third attempt, but it can push them forward for first and second attempts. And then you can end up being able to hit something realistic. I remember um, doing it with um LJ's client um when I heard I handled that First Nations cat. It was for her deadlifts. Like she really wanted, I think it was like 180 for a third. And like her opener was like okay, like wasn't super fast. And I kind of just said to her when she got off, I was like, you gotta smack this second or I'm not gonna load 180. And then she just like came out and did that that the exact thing. And then it was like the confidence of loading it. Yeah. But yeah, I guess like from my perspective, it's always like the thought process of like, especially if you are in a competition, um, like one on one, whoever it's like, you know, the goal is always to go like six from six and then you let deadlifts talk. So it's like, I guess I sort of just like lean into that anyway, like irrelevant of like, I guess not what number they've hit in training because like anything can happen on the platform. But it's like, you know, I, I tend to find that like when I use those reach or on attempts, it's like I kind of really only do it. I guess for deadlift or if I know like they're in a battle and like, we kind of need to potentially get some ground with squat and bench as well. Yeah. It's hard if it's someone bench, else's client as well. Right. Yeah. 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 I think with bench as well, it's like bench, you don't really have much room to play with. It's like, you kind of know what they're going to hit, hit a comp anyway. So usually that'll be one where it's like, okay, you're pretty much just going to hit this and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I find um, one more thing as well. Like I find the particular skill of making big jumps on deadlifts. That's probably a very crucial skill to have. Cause like Shania said, like you kind of got to let deadlifts talk. Right. But if you're used to making small jumps in training, it doesn't leave you much room on the day to kind of keep making big jumps to either overtake or keep position. Um, so similar to, similar to what we had to do at Newcastle for you, Shania, it was like when we adjusted warm ups, it's like, for deadlifts, we kind of need to create enough space for you to um, essentially jump big every single attempt because otherwise, like, the opposition can kind of guess what you're going to hit just based off, like, oh, if she's jumped 10 kilos, if she jumps 20, that's too much, right? So I think yeah. um, teaching, teaching or just having your athletes be used to taking big jumps specifically just for that component of deadlifting in competition I think is is really crucial. So like for attempts at selection purposes, I always have, um, in most cases, people starting pretty light and then jumping bigger um, into second and thirds. Yeah, to be honest, I've never actually jumped that much on deadlift ever. So it kind of just worked. I'm, I'm like, I used to be a small jumper, deadlift, especially like second last warm up to like a top set. But like when you, like obviously when you're saying like cool, like, 200 i was like well it means that second is gonna have to be 15s because it's just like oh well we got no option now but like since that comp that's all i do in training now it's pretty much just like 10 15 kilo jumps to anything so yeah, yeah. you kind of have to if you're trying to win right like yeah. if like if you're coming second you're gonna have to try and overtake somewhere right and if if the other opposition isn't used to big jumps that's your advantage there yeah but yeah um i think that'll that'll finish things off um it's another good episode of meet meet day and i hope you guys can take a bit away from this all right we'll see you guys next week on another episode of the roundtable thanks guys thank you thanks, Danny. thanks.